Now, one of the important things about this ability is that you got it for life. And uh, it's with you as long as you're alive. And you know that because all of, these, all of the abilities that, that control what you can and cannot do uh, are, are accounted for by brain change. And what your brain is actually doing is specializing its wiring. And the specialization of its wiring uh, is what underlies each skill, each ability that you've mastered in your life. And you know that at any point in life, people toward the end of life can still learn fundamentally new things, <laughs> right? And that's another way of saying they still have this great resource, this resource of plasticity within their brain. One of the most important things then f that we've tried to understand, and one of the most important <laughs> things that's occurring in the clinical evolution from individuals like Annette, who've thought a lot about these brain plasticity processes, is how to bring them under control, to drive the brain in a more powerful or more useful or in a corrective direction. And this is fundamentally what I'm interested in as a scientist. So understanding these processes, understanding how to control them from a neurological perspective, understanding what they might have contributed to the limitations in a child or in an adult, how can we use these very same processes, which are with you for life, to help you drive yourself back in a corrective direction? And I would say that that's also exactly what has been a primary motivation in the, in the practices of therapists like Annette, who in the same sense have tried to understand how to control this some powerful in, uh, in intrinsic process uh, to use it most effectively to drive correction in a brain that needs correction, begs for it. This is going to be a critical aspect of controlling its movements. I might say it's also a critical aspect of the therapeutic strategies that Annette and her predecessors have developed. The brain learns to control its movement on the basis of the sensory feedback, right? Movement is not just muscles. Movement is the relationship, going to be controlled by the relationship of the, from the sensory side. Elaborate interpretation of the sensory side is going to enable elaborate control of those movements. So the, one of the first jobs the brain has is to associate limb position and weighting on the muscle of, of, the, of the limbs, of the body, and so forth, in, relation, in relating movement to that sensory feedback. And in order to do that, the, the, the brain has to have a certain history. It has to go through a long period of controlling its movements randomly, and basically in, across those random movements, systematically associating limb position and the weighting of limbs and the body in relation to that sensory feedback. That's what the, all of that bouncing of the baby around in the womb is all about. And it's not done when the baby's born. The baby's going to continue this process. Looks like flailing. Looks like sort of largely purposeless, uh, 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 un unmeaningful, insignificant movement. All of that wiggling, contorting of the body, movement of the limbs, seemingly random. It's not seemingly random. It's necessarily random. If it wasn't random, then there would be strong, substantial, plastic changes that would be quickly dominant and embedded, okay? And in different forms, that, you, that could be called cerebral palsy. So it's got to be random, okay? First, you've got to sort it. Just like first, you have to sort the movements. If you don't have a refined sorting of the information that relates to how I feel in relation to how I move, you can't organize sophisticated and controlled movements. This is one thing I like so much about strategies in retraining brains in which a, focus, a strong focus is on sensory feedback, upon the feelings that are associated with the movements. This is exactly right. This is what the brain has to do. And this is one of the reasons why I think that Annette and the sort of strategies that have been applied in this descendant strategy from the Feldenkrais method is in the right direction of being a relatively powerful form of recovery of function when function hasn't developed in a normal way. Let's take the example of a, an animal that in its early life is not allowed to freely move his legs, or to put it another way, is constrained so that any time it attempts to move the leg, he moves the whole leg together. Or another variation might be, is constrained so that each time it attempts to move a leg, both of them move together. 
Now, we've done each one of these experiments in animals that are completely normal in every respect except the fact that we've altered the way sensory feedback could be used to guide the evolution of movement in this animal after birth. Every time we do that, we create cerebral palsy. Now, you probably have heard that cerebral palsy is due to uh, having something like an, 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 an oxygen period of oxygen deprivation at birth, and that that creates uh, some sort of physical damage or loss, and, and it does do that. That is true. Those, that is one of the modes of genesis of this condition. But what really causes the cerebral palsy, or you could say the most direct and immediate cause of this great distortion in movement, is its de-differentiation, its dis-elaboration that occurs because there's a competitive movement that's occurring repetitively in an environment in which the animal is still supposed to be flailing around. And still, that movement is supposed to be random, and here we have a non-random movement that's heavily pounded on, and it wins. And because it wins, that distorted movement gains power in the brain. When you're controlling your actions, it's not just about the action. Okay? It starts with the movement. And, and in fact, when you created a model of your world as a baby, you didn't start by having sophisticated movements. You started by elaborating the, sense, the, the sensory feedback that could contribute to the control of those movements. It's not just moving. It's not just physical muscle. And it, most of the things that limit movement are not problems that apply to the body. They're problems that apply to the brain. The problem is in the brain. And the problem is specifically in the brain as it relates to using sensory feedback from the body to control movement. Okay? It's about controlling these elaborate, this elaborate dance between feedback and movement. And that's something I like so much about this particular line of physical therapeutic practice. It acknowledges the fact that you have to fix the brain in concert, right? It's teamwork. All this is all about uh, improving your ability to operate in this dance.